The following interview originally appeared on Paul Elam's YouTube channel. However, White Ribbon Australia has found a way to block that video so that no one in Australia can view it and listen to this interview. We're not going to let that slide. So please download this video to your computer. Spread it around. Share it. Embed it. Do whatever you got to do. Mirror it to your own channels. Let's keep this up. Let's keep this information out here so the people can, of Australia can learn the truth about White Ribbon and the truth about domestic violence. Hello everyone and welcome to a special broadcast of A Voice for Man Radio. Tonight we're going to be examining White Ribbon Australia. You're going to hear from activists, academicians, tenured professors, scientists, and experts on the issue of domestic violence from around the world. Paul, tell us how you became interested in domestic violence and in the research surrounding domestic violence. Well, uh, the best way to describe it is in the two decades of work that I did with people who had substance abuse and alcoholism problems is, uh, as most people might figure out uh, without too much thinking those populations, people that are affected by drug abuse problems, drug addictions and alcoholism, there is a much higher than usual incidence of domestic violence uh, in those populations. And in treating those people, uh, most of what we do was actually treating the family because alcoholism and addiction and all the things that come with it, like violence, spread out throughout the family and affect everybody in it. So the core of our treatment was to go in and address what was happening with the family. It was a constant recurring theme that we had to address issues of violence within those families. So my experience with dealing uh, with violence as a family issue is quite lengthy, and I would uh, easily estimate it, that it affected more than half the people that I worked with over the course of 20-some-odd uh, years. And in the course of, of your work, did you see uh, a prevalence of men beating women, women beating men, or did you see it to be about equal? That's a great question, and there's two answers to it, Jack. Uh, in the beginning, I saw an almost overwhelming preponderance of the population where it was men that were physically assaulting women. However, that comes with a qualification. That was before I started asking if men had been the victims of domestic violence. You see, when I came into this, I followed pretty much the standard clinical line of the time, which was that men were generally the perpetrators and women were in general the victims, that there's possibly exceptions, but the, the rule was, as a matter of fact, this rule was extended so far, is that in our screening tools for people in admissions, we routinely asked women if they had been victimized by violence in the home. And we routinely asked men if they had committed violence in the home. We didn't ask women if they had perpetrated violence, and we didn't ask men if they had been on the receiving end of it. So for those first few years in the field, uh, I ended up getting the answers only to the questions that I was asking. However, when I started to become aware of more and more men bringing this up who were bringing it up without asking, I changed the nature of my work and started asking everybody. And from that moment forward, what I discovered was that the, the incidence of people committing violence was half or more women and half or less men. Uh, so yes, the numbers changed drastically just based on, on what I chose to investigate, uh, which is a whole lot to do with the problems in the domestic violence industry right now. So your your experience was uh, basically what the, the same as what we're seeing in, in studies and in uh, uh, the statistics. 
Yes, absolutely. And, and even more so, it's one it, to when we're talking about domestic violence, uh, it, it, it also, just like it depended on what questions I was asking people coming in the door to treatment, it really depends on how we're defining domestic violence. If we take those words literally, if, if we mean that it is violence that, are, that occurs within a domicile, within the domestic environment of a people in a family, we find that the preponderance of violence against children is committed by women. Uh, so uh, it, it isn't just really roughly, roughly a 50-50 uh, equation if we have a more comprehensive and I think more informed understanding of what domestic violence is. Uh, if we take that, it is edging toward being predominantly a female committed problem. I want to offer a however with that though. That saying that does not mean I believe that the problem is gendered. And so there's a real big difference. So we have an abundance of research that shows that domestic violence going back is a learned behavior that's passed down generationally that the the antecedents or the precursors that we like to call them to uh, domestic violence are more often alcohol and substance abuse, poverty, lack of education, abuse in childhood, a lot of other factors that have nothing to do with an individual's gender, that are, they are problems that can affect anybody. Uh, but for me to, say, to observe that perhaps the slight majority are female isn't really telling us anything about the nature of the abuser. Uh, it is no more a female problem than it is a male problem. One of the reasons that we see a preponderance of abuse against children by women, for instance, I suspect, is because that the custody uh, bias against fathers in courts is so great that 84% of the time mothers end up with sole custody or either that or controlling custody of children. So they're the ones that are dealing with a lot of frustrations. They're the ones that are, have more opportunity and perhaps more incentive at time, although I use the word incentive loosely, um, to commit violence against children. We might see if there were an equitable court system that uh, mandated shared custody or that, that viewed fathers without bias and gave them custody uh, when they should be the, the, the custodial parent, then we might see those numbers shift. It may have to do with who, is, who has the burden, the responsibility of taking care of the child. But I've seen nothing in 20 years of clinical work and in the, I guess, 35 years now, I've spent researching gender issues and matters like violence. I've never seen anything that demonstrated with any empiricism whatsoever that indicated that the problem was rooted in sex. It's just not. So it's uh, the same factors that would we can trace uh, a criminal behavior back to are similar to the factors we can trace uh, violent behavior in interpersonal relationships. We back to those same. Uh, uh, so circumstances. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, I was just reading something the other day that a huge percentage of uh, men right now that are incarcerated for rape were violently or otherwise sexually abused by their mothers or a close female to the family. Um, it should not come as a surprise that that sort of anger, the, the retributive anger that is sparked from sexual abuse might be acted out as an adult. So how many rapists would be in prison now or how many rapes would be committed if we were able to perceive the reality that women are in fact perpetrators of sexual abuse against many children to intervene there, to, to take measures to stop that from happening, it would stop rapists from being formed in their personality. These are men, many times, I sincerely believe, that are growing up and acting out revenge on their abusive mothers or abusive females from their childhood on grown women in their adult lives. They're simply repeating the cycle. 
Uh, unfortunately, our society is very, very reluctant to look at women as perpetrators of anything, even when the perpetration is aberrant and, and, and absolutely egregious. We still tend to rescue them, look for reasons why it wasn't their fault. Uh, we have almost an epidemic right now of school teachers uh, grooming and sexually abusing their adolescent and pre-adolescent male, male and female students, and we look the other way while it happens. Some of them are punished. Some of them get a slap on the hand. Uh, but it is almost comical. If it weren't so tragic, it would be comical to watch social scientists scratch their heads and say, gee, why are so many rapes being committed? Well, there must be something wrong with masculinity. No, folks, it's something wrong with abusing boys who grow up to abuse. That's something we've known for a long time. And so, yes, almost any social ill that you can target, Jack, that you can look at, you can trace a high likelihood of certain characteristics uh, among them, fatherlessness, among, among them being abused by women, uh, among them coming from homes that are broken and impoverished, coming from homes where violence is role modeled for them, coming from homes where there are chemical, depends, chemical dependency or alcohol issues. There's your common denominators that you find in so many of those cases. It's right in front of our faces. The research has proved it for the past 50 years, yet today we are totally ignoring it in favor of the gender politics of saying, hey, it's toxic masculinity. It's an absolute shame, but that's what's happening. You are listening to A Voice for Men Radio. Please tune in to The Voice of Europe with Lucian Valson and John Gunnarsson, Fridays, 1 p.m. Central. A AVoiceforMen.com, flagship of the men's human rights movement. You said this a while ago, and I believe that you basically reiterated it, that this domestic violence is not a gendered issue. It has nothing to do with a person's gender. It has to do with their background and how they were raised. Is, is that right? Uh, yes, it, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, I, I challenge anybody. There is not one shred of scientific evidence to suggest that domestic violence has anything to do with gender. Now, there are some studies out there that are conducted by ideologues. You can look at uh, research by people like Mary Koss and others of her ilk who were committed to an outcome before they ever started their research that conclude with very, very faulty methodology uh, that things like toxic masculinity being at the root of violence and of sexual assaults and things like that. But if you Google Martin Fiebert, or Fiebert, I believe it's pronounced, um, Southern Cal and domestic violence studies, you'll come up with an annotated bibliography of hundreds and hundreds of studies, uh, which some of which were surveys, some of which were empirical reviews, other kinds of research, all pointing in the same direction. Women are as likely or even a little more likely than men to initiate violence in the home. That is what the non-ideological research comes from people who are engaging in honest scholarly pursuits. But when it gets into the, when you see, if you look at the researcher and go back in their history, which is easy through Google, and you see a degree in gender studies and you see feminist that and feminist this and sitting in this organization for women and that, then that's where you get some, and I put research in scare quotes, some research that points the finger at this as a gendered issue. Um, I don't think people are buying that so much anymore because the reality on the ground is just so much different uh, than what is reflected in that biased research. Yeah, people are, are looking around at the, 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 the people around them in the world and going, uh, yeah, this is more than just men beating on women. This is people beating on people. Now, uh, the research shows that domestic violence is oftentimes mutual. Uh, could you tell us a little more about that? Sure. Uh, there's Domestic violence is basically 
broken down into two categories. One is unilateral, and the other is reciprocal, in, or unilateral, another way of putting it is one directional violence. That's where there is one aggressive partner who hits the other, and the other partner does not hit back. The CDC did a study of violence in 2007, released results that they found in unilateral violence, in one directional violence, 70%, 70% of the perpetrators were female and 30% were male. Um, uh, for those of you listening, I'll say it again. They found in violent relationships where there was only one perpetrator of violence that 70% of them were women. Um, the other thing that that study found uh, this is a CDC 2007, was that women who committed violence in relationships were had a very high likelihood of repeating that violence. The 30% of men who had committed the unilateral violence were not near as likely to repeat it again. So we have, whether it's uh, society systemic rules or or some other factor in how we, we socialize men and women. Women who abuse physically are likely to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. Men who abuse physically are far less likely to repeat it again. The other type of violence, and the 2007 CDC study uh, addressed that as well, was bidirectional or mutual combat where things escalate. You see this a lot in chemically dependent families where they get in arguments over money, over drugs, over money for drugs, or over whatever is frustrating them at the moment uh, that's aggravated by their substance abuse, by dysfunctional family rules, and it escalates. It goes from talking to voices being raised, to shouting and screaming, to names being called, to a push or a shove that is immediately reciprocated and the next thing you know, you have an all-out fight. Now, in this mutual violence situation is the, is the scenario where women are most likely to be hurt. Uh, not too much of a stretch on intelligence to figure out why. Men are larger by an, uh, on average. Uh, they are more physically capable of inflicting harm with violence as long as bare hands are used. But we also find that women are just as likely to pick up weapons and to use them. And in some cases, more likely. Women are also more likely to use proxy violence, to enlist the help of another male to go commit violence in her name on whoever she wants to be targeted. Uh, but either way, all of these involve both people escalating a situation until it gets into physical combat. And in that case, of course, uh, socially, we tend to identify the male as the aggressor, even if he wasn't the one that struck the first blow. Or we identify as him, him as the problem because he is on average larger than women, so that means that he should not do anything to defend itself, himself. When, of course, human nature tells us that under the right circumstances, all human beings are going to defend themselves in one way or another. It's an instinctive reflex. Um, but those are two basically the different kinds of violence. There's a kind where there's one abuser uh, who, if the abuser is female, is likely to repeat over and over again in a relationship until she provokes the violent reaction that she's looking for. And then there is the mutual combat that is a product of escalating arguing to where either side could actually initiate, initiate the first push or shove but it, it evolves and escalates into both people hitting each other. Now, out of the entire population, how many or what percentage of people are we talking about who engage in uh, uh, this type of behavior, dom domestic violence? I've seen studies that range anywhere from 12 to 24 percent. But I think what is a really important number to remember here, Jack, is that in terms of what we call domestic violence, while, you know, you would find if you investigated most marriages, 
there was probably some time in a 10-year marriage that one or both people got slapped or that one or both people got shoved or pushed or got a, a magazine thrown at them. Anything that we would consider a violent act are happening in an awful lot of marriages. I think, that, honestly, that the 24% estimate is kind of low. Um, human beings have conflicts. It doesn't mean they don't care about each other. It doesn't mean that their marriage ends. It means that they're, they're human. They have failings. And on a bad day, they're prone to doing stupid things. But what really sort of should be driven home to people is that the percentage of people who receive serious injuries in domestic bio violence situations is exceedingly, exceedingly small. It is a very, very small percentage of the population who are so injured due to domestic violence that they actually require hospital care. Now, there are people that will show up at a hospital because, okay, they've got divorce on their minds. Um, he pushed me into a wall. It left a little bruise on my arm. So I'm going to go show the doctors the bruise and get this documented, even though we all know we don't need medical attention for a bruise. But the people that actually require serious medical attention because of domestic violence is minuscule compared to the people who actually experience some forms of violence in their relationships. So, yes, up to 12 to 24 percent of relationships have at one point or another or will experience some form of violence in that relationship. Almost none of them will require medical intervention, and I would uh, argue that almost none of them require legal intervention either. So you're saying that there's the most or the majority of domestic violence is, you know, one time someone had a bad day and slapped the other one. And it was just a one-time thing. It doesn't happen again. And the people, the two, the couple works it out and they move on. The minority of domestic violence is this, what we've been led to believe of this woman who's been beaten because she burned the toast. Oh yeah. The, the, it, it's a sort of, it's a, not a sort of, it's an urban myth, uh, in our culture that we have a domestic violence problem that's characterized by the factory worker coming home and beating his wife half to death because she didn't know how to fry the egg to his liking. Uh, I'm sure that there have been incidents in history where something like that has happened. There are crazies out there in this world. There really are. They're criminal. And in that case, they do need to be locked up, just like women who beat on their husband or children because they had a bad day with one of their friends and had a spat and they're going to take it out uh, by physically abusing their children or by physically abusing their husband. Those people exist and they ought to be locked up and, uh, and not let out until they've had sufficient counseling or, so, or show sufficient progress to determine that they're not a threat to society, which is why we build prisons to begin with. It is not to necessarily uh, to do much more than to make sure that society is safe from people like this. But the idea that we have an epidemic of men coming home with uh, red eyed and and full of rage and going off and destroying furniture and beating their wife with the leg of the, of the coffee table uh, after they've broken it to pieces uh, because she said she didn't have time to get dinner on the table by six o'clock sharp is absolute insanity. That is not what is going on in this country at all. Some of it, tiny, tiny fraction, yeah, uh, probably about as many people as, as that rob banks. Okay, when a woman commits domestic violence against a man, what is her her reasoning for doing it? Is it is she fighting back? Is is it sh she's fighting the patriarchy or, or why? Why does she do it? <laughs> um, uh, for the same reasons that men sometimes slap their wives or push them or 
throw a magazine at them, uh, which is to say that there can be a thousand different reasons. Now, of course, for the uh, comment miners out there, uh, I'm not saying that the reason is an excuse. I'm saying what is the motivation there? Uh, sometimes, um, let's say a guy is a nagger, and there are men that nag. And let's say that every time he comes home, he says, this wasn't done right. You didn't do that right. You didn't do this right. Why are you hanging out with that woman? I don't like her. I don't want you to have friends like that over here. As a matter of fact, I don't want you to have any friends over here. Somebody that lives under that kind of pressure, which men do all the time, is prone at some point or another to lose control of their anger and snap. That's one motivation that can happen for either sex. Another motivation is that something happened that was remarkably hurtful, like an affair. Let's say that uh, a woman or a man catches their spouse cheating and their spouse happens to be right in front of them, right as the news is delivered. They lose control and they strike out physically. That happens, not saying it's excusable, not saying that it's right. But if people are asking me what the reason is, the reason is extreme pain from feeling betrayed. Um, there are people that argue over money and worry over it to the point that they fight over money regularly, over how money is spent, um, and it escalates into a situation where sooner or later somebody snaps and gets physical. These are family problems. They're family issues. And once we have turned that into a criminal event, uh, what we're doing is finishing driving the nails in on the family. Uh, once you're committed to something, like, like, let's say that uh, a guy comes home from work every day and the wife is just like, well, if you made more money, we wouldn't be living this way. We'd have a nicer home. You're a failure as a man. Uh, you know, why don't you get a second job? Uh, how come you come home and you then you lay around and watch TV? You should be up doing the dishes and, and vacuuming the floor and helping me with housework. And I read in Cosmo that uh, you're supposed to be doing more of that stuff. I know that you were digging ditches for eight hours, uh, but that doesn't mean that I have to do all the dirty dishes. That sort of diatribe happens in a lot of homes. And let's say the guy one day just loses it. He's had a particularly bad day. Maybe he got slightly injured at work. Maybe his boss was talking to him the same way all day long. And a lot of men do experience this at work. They are berated. They're pushed around. And what they try to do is keep their heads down, work their butts off, and keep their job, which is honestly what most men, including uh, blue-collar men and white-collar men, that's what they do. This guy comes home to, you're not good enough, you're no good, you're stupid, you don't have a good enough job, you're not a man, you don't take care of the family, and one day he explodes and slaps her for that. We've got some choices on how to handle that. It's obviously a sign that things have gone too far in the relationship, that there needs to be an intervention. But once you call police, and because the only thing the police care about is whether or not he slapped her, they don't care whether or not that she was emotionally and psychologically abusing him for the years that led up to that slap, what they care about is that slap. So, okay, they put on the cuffs, haul him off to jail. Then it's lawyer time, not just for his criminal case, but this is what takes people directly. This is the straw that takes people directly into divorce court. This is where children end up having to choose allegiances to one of their parents. It's where the court's rip away all the assets of the man where the family is literally destroyed and divided over an incident that would be much better addressed by competent mental health professionals than by law enforcement. And that is, uh, to me, a bigger problem than domestic violence itself. You are listening to A Voice for Men Radio. Please tune in to When Did You Wake Up with Aaron Pitsy and Dean Esme and Tales from the Infrared with Christian Chasen, Rachel Edwards, Jim Kelvarn, Nefanora Frawl, and Dean Esme, alternating Saturdays, 1 p.m. Central. A AvoiceforMen.com, flagship of the men's human rights movement. Okay, that brings us to this organization in Australia, 
that is today having their White Ribbon Day. It, their organization is White Ribbon Australia. Okay, Paul, I've looked at the website. I know you've looked at the website. Um, what is your opinion of this organization and their uh, quote-unquote attempts to end domestic violence? They're a group of con artists that are bilking the taxpayers and donors for to the tune of somewhere around a million five a year. They're spreading that money around to themselves in the form of salaries and travel expenses. I don't know if they're going to Paris or, or where they're going, but what you will notice, and we will have today up on A Voice for Men, a copy of their financials. The one thing you will find really noticeably missing from their expense account is services. They do actually nothing except raise money. They do have a petition you can sign saying uh, that's based on the gendered model uh, of domestic violence, which is a lie. So not only are they, uh, in my opinion, committing fraud uh, by uh, raising money for some for an organization that doesn't do anything other than raise money and pay itself, but they're doing it with fraudulent information. They are setting forth a gendered model. Their pledge asks people to commit, well, excuse me, I will rephrase it. Their pledge asks men to commit to never hitting women. If you look through the White Ribbon Australia campaign, you will see that violence against men is not even acknowledged to exist. And they play on people's natural human instinct to protect women by having this campaign that focuses only on violence against women, that ignores violence against men, and more importantly, and this is what I, I really hope people get, folks, the primary victims of domestic violence is the children in homes that are violent. Those children are the ones whose schoolwork is affected because they're worried and don't sleep. They're the ones that are going to bed every night and putting pillows over their heads so they don't hear the yelling and screaming and arguing. They're the ones that are worried constantly that their families are going to break up, that they're going to lose one or both of their parents. They're the ones who are truly traumatized by the violence in the home. And White Ribbon Australia and every other white ribbon campaign out there, except for one, makes its money off of sentencing those children to lives in the middle of abuse if the abuser happens to be a woman. <coughs> this to me is as, I think P.T. Barnum would be proud. Uh, uh, he said there's sucker, a sucker born every minute he lived in a far less populated world than we live in now because the fact is there are thousands of suckers born every second. And White Ribbon Australia is a campaign designed to play off of the human decency of people who don't want to see women harmed by selling them lies and selling their children down the river. They're doing it knowingly and they're doing it on purpose. Okay, you said they raise all this money, and and what what are they doing with it? What what are they doing with all as this? As far money? as I can tell from their, well, they're doing a lot of traveling. Uh, we will have today out on the side a copy of their financial. Luckily, the uh, Australian government requires them to turn in records of their finances, and we have them. And we will be putting them out there today. Uh, by the time most people hear this broadcast, they will be available on the front page of avoiceformen.com. What you will see is a record of their income and expenses. I don't have it in front of me now, but you will be able to see it on the site. Um, the money is increasing. They, uh, they collected more in, 2012, in 2013 than they did in 2012. A huge part of that money, hundreds of thousands, goes to the salaries of a very small group of people. There was always, also 
tens of thousands of dollars, uh, 150,000 plus, if I remember, dedicated to their travel um, and to their expenses. There was huge amounts of money spent on miscellaneous or associated expenses, whatever they are. There was a significant amount of money spent on marketing what they do, which is to get out there and promote more fundraising. What you will not see on there is one nickel going to a battered women's shelter. What you will not see on there is one nickel going to the services for people that are affected by domestic violence. And we're not just talking about men here, we're talking about anyone. What Right Ribbon Campaign Australia does is they do a dog and pony show for the public. They scrape up all the money, they pocket a big chunk of it, and then they go raise more money. That's what they do. Oh, and they get people to sign an online petition. Um, really, uh, this is so sickening that you have to wonder how it's allowed to continue. Uh, but I can assure you that I'm going to let your show, Jack, be the first place that I announce it. <coughs> when it comes out on the site, it will also be announced. We are proclaiming November 25th of each year, which just happens to be their White Ribbon Day. Um, we have procured the domain. We are going to have a website up. We are going to do much more investigation into all the White Ribbon campaigns in Australia, in the United Kingdom, uh, in particular in Canada too. And November 25th, we will be aggressively promoting White Ribbon Fraud Day. And we are going to point at all these cheating, lying organizations who are selling false information to the public in order to bilk money out of them in order to line their own pockets. We're not, we don't know if we can stop them, but I tell you what, we are going to make sure and we have commitments from a lot of people inside and outside of ABM, ABFM, people in the domestic violence industry, a lot of other people that are working against some of the damages of gender feminism, uh, the domestic violence lies being one of the more major examples of it, who are going to be committed to joining us in this and to have a yearly campaign just prior to their big day to let the people of the world know that White Ribbon Australia is a bunch of lying con artists. Uh, let me close this out by saying one, one last thing, Jack. When we started a website called whiteribbon.org, because the domain was available and it's not a trademark name in the United States, we don't have a donation button on the site. We don't want people to donate to whiteribbon.org. That site is dedicated to getting all the research you mentioned earlier, all the stuff by, there's an interview there with Martin Fieber. There's an interview there with Murray Strauss. There's an interview there. Uh, these are, are recorded interviews, just like this one. Uh, uh, another one with Don Dutton. There are articles by Aaron Pitsy, who is the founder of the domestic violence shelter movement for women. Uh, there are a number of true and real experts on the subject of domestic violence, all of whom, uh, and I'm talking about people that are world renowned as the leading experts on this subject, all of whom, every last one of them, will tell you that domestic violence is a problem uh, that is experienced in gender symmetry, meaning that men and women both committed at roughly equal rates, uh, that children are the ones most impacted, that it is a learned behavior from dysfunctional families, and that it is not, in fact, a gendered issue. These are the leading experts on the world, and their information, their research has been buried under feminist propaganda for many years. It is our mission to help whiteribbon.org get it out. That site now is headed by Erin Pitsy. She owns the domain. Um, we, I am not allowed to, nor do I want to speak on behalf of whiteribbon.org, but we are happy to be the, the web hosting company for it, and we will be for as long as they need us. 
Uh, but that organization, edited by Her Aaron Pitsy, the founder of the shelter movement for women in 1971, is dedicated to getting the truth about domestic violence out there in the face of all the lies by organizations like whiteribbon.org. They, by the way, when we first launched that website under ABF Film and under my ownership, they came out in the media very aggressively calling us liars and thieves and that we had hijacked their campaign. Um, one, that's not true. Uh, we did legally own the domain name. White Ribbon Campaign is not something that was trademarked in the United States. So there was nothing unethical or illegal about what we did. Erin stepped up and asked us. She saw it and said, look, this is something that I've wanted to do my whole life. Uh, is there any way you would consider letting me have the domain? Uh, we thought, why not? She's the right person. So we gave it to her. She was running it. Uh, White Ribbon Australia made all kinds of noise about suing us. And let me tell you why that that was all bull. Let me tell you why that White Ribbon Australia would not dare sue us. It's because the process of discovery in a lawsuit would reveal what con artists and frauds these people really are. Uh, I wish they had sued. I really do. And they still have an invitation, please, File a lawsuit against ABFM. Also, while you're at it, file a lawsuit against the woman who founded the Battered Women's Shelter movement. I'm sure she would have some words for you, too. But the reason they won't do this is because they know that during normal court discovery in a lawsuit, they will be exposed for the con artists that they happen to be. This... So... Uh, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around this. Their job is to raise money, which they get paid for, so they can raise more money. It, it, did I that's just, it. That, that's it. Okay. Now, they are selling to the public misinformation, to put it politely. Lies, to put it yes. bluntly. Yes, yes. Okay. To put it more accurately, yes, they're selling lies. All right. What, it, d, this isn't just little innocent white lies. These lies cause pain and suffering and death to men, to women, and to children. And the government, this isn't just private donations. If, if I'm understanding you correctly, this isn't just private donations. The government, the taxpayers of Australia are paying for this, correct? That's correct. So. It, 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 these guys, it, the best way to look at this, Jack, is to understand that White Ribbon Australia can be compared to tobacco companies. They peddle in something toxic, telling you that it's something else, and then they laugh all to the way to the bank, and they don't care who it hurts. They could care less. You think with maybe a million and a half in a year in revenue, they could come up with $5 to give to a shelter? They don't do it. They don't do anything of the sort. They rake in money with a false narrative. They tell people uh, that a problem exists that with only half of the story stated, they lie to people creating not just individual damage to men, women, and children, but causing public damage by widening this gap between men and women of mistrust, by telling women that this is all a man's problem, that women don't do this sort of thing, and it's men that, that are not to be trusted. That's exactly what they're selling. So it hurts people individually affected by this problem, and it hurts everybody across the board by not helping them understand the nature of domestic violence and the things that we need to do to intervene in order to prevent more of it from happening. So they're creating violence. They're creating mistrust between the sexes, and they are abandoning and leaving children 
in the homes of violent women to be abused until the day they can get out of it, and they are likely to grow up and abuse more people, just like tobacco companies, Jack. It's like, you know, we don't care. We'll make Joe Camel so that Camel cigarettes are more appealing to children. Uh, because cartoon characters sell to children well. That way we can recruit in the users that we kill with our product and replace them with people who aren't dead yet and can still buy our product. It's the same mentality there. These are sociopaths. They don't care. Uh, they don't care if it ends up hurting the whole world. If laws are raking in a mill five a year and it's growing, they'll be out there doing the same thing unless somebody puts a stop to their sick criminal enterprise. You are listening to A Voice for Men Radio. Please tune in to the Vanguard Report with Fiddlebogan and Nick Redding Monday nights, 6 p.m. Central Time, and Blue Collar Red Pill with Dan Perrins and Jack Barnes Monday nights, 7 p.m. Central Time. A Voice for Men.com, flagship of the men's human rights movement. Let's talk some more about their rhetoric, because I, I, I read a, probably two pages worth on their website and got, well, angry, to say the least. It seemed, and I, I said this to Dean Esme earlier, asking him a question about this, it seems that they are only interested in protecting women from the violence that is perpetrated by men. They don't care about the violence that is perpetrated against women by other women, and they don't care about the violence that's perpetrated against men by men or women. So they... I wish I wish it were that good. They're not even interested in the violence perpetrated against women by men. If they are fostering a system where male children grow up in a home with a violent mother who beats on the dad, who beats on the children, and they ignore that problem and pretend that it doesn't exist. They have a high likelihood of that boy growing into a man that someday is going to make somebody pay for what happened. In a lot of cases, that will be a woman. And what they'll do, rather than change their ways and help stop that from happening, they will use that little boy that grows up as a product of his violent mother and gets revenge on the first woman he marries is an example as to why that this is a problem with men. It is even worse, uh, if you can imagine, than what you described. They don't care about violence against anybody. What they care is about that cha-ching coming into the cash registers regularly. That's why they were upset that whiteribbon.org was started and it's why they're going to be a whole lot more upset over the course of the next week. What advice do you have for the citizens of Australia who are genu genuinely interested in helping uh, victims of domestic violence? Uh, well, I had two things in mind. One, don't give White Ribbon any money. If you've given them money, quit giving them money. If you're considering giving them money, do not give them money. Hurt them financially. The other thing that they can do is start challenging their government officials. Um, I would look up if uh, uh, men like George Christensen, who has spoken about this uh, uh, as an MP uh, to the Australian Parliament, uh, there are other politicians there that are on the right side of this issue. But people need to speak up and understand that when you buy in to a lie that only men commit violence and only against women, you're condemning children to be abused. You may not intend to. That may not be something that you think is in your character. But if you buy this lie that DV that intimate partner violence is a gendered problem, you are harming children, and you are allowing your politicians to harm children. So please contact your elected officials and tell them that you want your government to have an evidence-based, non-gendered model of addressing intimate partner violence and of making sure 
that all victims and all perpetrators are identified and that their issues are handled and that the children who live in homes of violent mothers are protected from that and not abandoned just because the abuser happens to be female. Uh, those two things, contact your government, talk about this problem, talk about it in your family, talk about it amongst your friends, but most of all, don't give White Ribbon a nickel, not a nickel, and encourage everybody you know to withhold funding and to call public attention to this problem because White Ribbon Australia is committing a massive fraud on the Australian people right now. This problem with the misinformation it is not just White Ribbon Australia. This comes from somewhere else, doesn't it, Paul? Isn't it a, 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 an underlying yeah, problem? Real... Oh, sure, in, in two ways. One, White Ribbon Australia is just one of the White Ribbon campaigns. They have equally dishonest uh, uh money leaching operations in Canada uh, and in the UK. Uh, I'm sure they intend to spread it to other countries. Uh, they may have a problem in the, in the, in the, U, in the USA at this point because uh, um, there is already a white ribbon program that's dedicated to correcting their lots. Uh, so that will make it more difficult for them. But the, the far reaching part of this, where this gets down to, is that we still live in a culture that is way behind the times on understanding both women's and men's issues. We still live in a culture. It's very easy. You know, um, I've been a writer for 25 years. If I had decided that integrity meant nothing, that uh, telling the truth meant nothing, and if I had decided to make my living off of lies, I'm quite sure I could be doing very well right now just by picking up the feminist narrative and preaching feminist lines and attacking anybody who disagreed with them. Um, you know, I'm a fairly skilled activist. I could have done well at that. Unfortunately, I have a moral compass and I have a conscience. Um, and and what I found in the work I've done, trying to bring attention to issues that affect men and boys, not just women and girls, is that we still live in a culture that has the idea that men don't have problems, men are the problem. Uh, we want to burden men with everything. We, it, we are very, very reluctant to see men as victims. And this is something that's not going to change overnight. It also happens to be the bread and butter of White Ribbon Australia. The social mindset that men are here for no other reason than to protect women makes it very easy to sell their lives to the public. Uh, the knee jerk of most decent human beings. I'm not talking about people being stupid or or even brainwashed, but the knee jerk for most decent human beings, if, if, if women are under threat, we must do something to protect them. And that, you can call that what you want, but it's human nature. The people at White Ribbon understand that. They understand that if they flash up a picture of a woman with bruises on her face, cowering in the corner in the dark, crying, and a man standing over, here with it, over her with his, his fist clenched, that is money. That is absolute money in the bank. Anybody that's going to try to stop that, somebody, a lot of people will write checks for it. But the problem is, is that we live in a culture that does not understand that there are many, many times when that person in the quarter protecting themselves and weeping in the shadows is a man or a child. And it does happen. When we get people to wake up to that and understand that we can really do real things with the domestic violence issue, we can really do real interventions if we are dealing with scientifically known information about where it originates, like poverty, drug abuse, uh, lack of education, all the other things we've already mentioned, then we can start doing real programs that will prevent a lot of domestic violence 
issues. But as long as the public is willing to accept the message that it's the evil men beating up on poor saintly women, and that's the only description that domestic violence requires, we will never get anything but more domestic violence and a very, very affluent white ribbon campaign. That isn't the answer. Okay, Paul, is there anything else that you would like to add? I would ask, I'd like to ask people, yes, and, and thanks for the opportunity, Jack, and thank you for having me here uh, to do this, because I think this is probably one of the most important social messages we can be getting out there right now. If people want to help with this, we don't need your money. We don't. I would invite you to visit Aaron Pitsy's website, whiteribbon.org. That's whiteribbon.org. And listen to the interviews with the experts, with the world-renowned experts on domestic violence. Read the articles by them. In particular, read Murray Strauss's article about uh, how feminists go about punishing anyone who publishes research that's not consistent with their idea, with the white ribbon style idea of what domestic violence is. It will absolutely blow your mind. It's all true, it's all documented, it's all there. Visit that site and learn what domestic violence really is, how it starts, and more about what we need to do to combat it. And please join us. If you're listening to this podcast, if you're uh, reading the article at ABFM or at any of the other sites that it will be running on, if you see it on Twitter or Facebook, please share it with others. Please pass the word around. Right now, we have an organization in, in Australia that is without resistance, without any kind of intervention from the state or from the people there, is literally conning people out of millions of dollars every few years, sticking it in their pockets and traveling around partying on another part of the money. If you want that to stop, help us get the word out. White Ribbon Australia is a fraud. White Ribbon Canada is a fraud. White Ribbon UK is a fraud. The only place anywhere you're going to get the honest truth without a request for you to donate money about domestic violence is to go to whiteribbon.org and start reading, watching the videos there, and listening to the interviews. If you will do that, you'll help us move toward a time when those children that we're now sentencing to live with abusive mothers will have a chance of getting out and getting help and where the abusive mothers and abusive fathers will have a chance of finding the counseling they need in order to learn different ways to manage their frustrations in life other than striking out physically. And that's what I, I hope people do in the coming week ahead because we're certainly not going to be quiet about this. You are listening to A Voice for Men Radio. Please tune in to the O'Hara News and Editorial with Robert O'Hara and James Huff, Tuesday nights, 8 p.m. Central. A Voice for Men.com, flagship of the men's human rights movement. <laughs>